Thank you. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Woo! A little louder. Yeah, we got it. If you're still getting your food, we'll give you a moment to gather your food and come on out to the tables. Thank you so much. What a powerful beginning, everybody. Let's show your appreciation for the amazing drummers of Sodaiku. So good evening and welcome to the 2024 Justice in Action Awards. My name is Cindy Shu. <laughs> I'm so happy to join you tonight and my co-host Sri Srinivasan for the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. All right, Sri, everyone knows Sri, but I just need to go through some stuff. He is the co-founder and CEO of the digital consultancy DigiMentors and a founder of the South Asian Journalists Association. He has left his imprint on, oh my gosh, I'm seeing like dots, it's these lights, um, on many institutions across his city, including the Met Museum, hello, Columbia University. Welcome to Sri. Thank you so much, Cindy. This is a true highlight of my year to be able to work with you and the great folks at Aldef. Thank you for that beautiful introduction and thank you for being here this evening. Let me ask you, who are you wearing? Who am I wearing? Actually, my sister-in-law is Dr. Kristen Shu. She's in California. She is an oral surgeon, but she has this creative side. So she designs jackets on the side. So this Woo! is her coat. Look, look at it. Look, it's purple. It's <laughs> but I just have to tell you, she's so wonderful. She's Filipino, and uh, so she named her company Sese, which means to take care of, because she takes care of patients and everyone in these coats. So that's who I'm wearing. That's amazing. <laughs> and so she did the good Asian daughter, yes, became she did. A, a doctor, an yeah. oral surgeon, and now she's showing her creative side. Yes. That's, that's wonderful. <laughs> And you know, I should what tell are you. you wearing? So I'm wearing my, but I'm wearing the oldest garment in this whole room. I found my father-in-law's 1974 handmade suit, three-piece suit, and 1974 is the year that All Deaf was born. So I'm wearing my. I think it was made for really warm. Uh, I mean, very cold places. I'm full <laughs> pure wool, and I'm melting down here, but. Uh, about Cindy, everybody knows Cindy, everybody watches her on TV, and we're so lucky to have her. She's a reporter and anchor at CBS2 News, and she, her Emmy award-winning reporting has raised awareness of the hardship faced by Chinese refugees smuggled into this country. She's a mental health advocate, publicly sharing her personal story of depression and recovery, is, an on, is an, on the board, the national board of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, Let's thank Cindy for the work she's doing. Thank you. I don't think in our community we talk enough about mental health. How did you have the courage to speak up? You know, it was actually, it, was, it happened in 2015, but it was because COVID hit and everyone was feeling, you know, mental challenges. So that I felt like that was the time to just open up. Yeah. And yeah. What you may not know about her is that she also paddled for years on a championship <laughs> dragon boat racing team. Woo! That's a great name, <laughs> Women in Canoe. Women, that's right. <laughs> All right, we are here at Pier 60 in New York City to recognize three fabulous individuals for their outstanding achievements in support of Asian American communities. They exemplify the ideals we all aspire to uphold, service to others, leadership by example, and mastery of craft and profession. We're also here to commemorate All Def's 50th anniversary, 50 Woo! years. And throughout the evening, we'll share highlights from the past five decades. All Def has established its legacy of tireless advocacy for all Asian American communities across the country. The staff, board, and volunteers who serve this cause deserve our warmest appreciation. We will celebrate them throughout, but if you have ever worked with or for All Deaf, please stand up right now and let's applaud you. Please stand up, everybody. Look at these folks. People have come from all over the world, come back home to All Deaf, and we're so grateful that you're here. Now, although All Deaf usually celebrates the Lunar New Year, this year the 50th Anniversary Gala is taking place during AAPI Heritage Month. 
During the month of May, we continue to raise awareness about Asian American contributions to history, and we must recognize those among us who stand out. So that's what we're doing tonight. Sam Kichi, Don Tamaki, and Simu Lu is going, are, are three honorees, and they join a long and venerable list of Justice in Action Award honorees and recipients. In years past, Aldiff has recognized right on the stage the late Congressman John Lewis. As we say these names, let's applaud them. John Lewis, Preet Bharara, David Henry Wong, B.D. Wong, Seymour Hirsch, Cal Penn, Harry Belafonte, Fareed Zakaria, most recently, Congressman, Congresswoman Grace Meng, and the great Yoko Ono. <laughs> the Justice in Action Awards recognize individuals who've demonstrated their commitment to advancing social justice. And we'll hear much more about tonight's honorees as the program unfolds. And of course, we are here tonight to celebrate Aldef's 50th anniversary. And to pay tribute to this important milestone, Aldef has gathered some timeless and some infamous cases, stories about its clients, cases, and daily life in the office. Beyond a few amusing tales, Aldef's 50 Stories booklet is a heartwarming collection of five decades of everyday heroes in action. And all of you have a copy of this booklet in your tote bags. There it is. Margaret's already got it up there. So everyone, please read it. And remember that just showing up here today, you think you've done your part. No, you got to keep <laughs> giving and again and again give to all deaf. And we're joined this evening by many current and former All Deaf staff and board members, as well as student interns from each of the last five decades since the 1970s. They've represented All Deaf in court, marched on picket lines, monitored elections in 14 states, and polled voters outdoors in rain, snowstorms, and all kinds of weather. They spent evenings and weekends in the All Deaf office assembling legal briefs and translating legal rights pamphlets. Well, we're off to a great start as you enjoy the evening. Please be sure to save, save your, share your favorite moments on social media. Use the hashtag AllDef50, AllDef50. Please share it so we can take a look. And now, please help me welcome to the stage co-president of AllDef's board of directors, Richard Kim, <laughs> Richard, and Phil Tajitsu Nash. Thank you, uh, Sri and Cindy. Good evening, everyone. My name is Phil Tajitsu Nash. Hi, and I'm Richard Kim. Thank you for everyone for coming. We're, we're grateful to see so many familiar faces around the room. As board co-presidents, we feel privileged to be part of this important organization. Since its founding, ALDEF has been committed to promoting the civil rights of Asian Americans and advocating for social justice. Without your support, and I mean the support of every person in the room, we couldn't do the important work we've been doing. We've been helping individuals. We've been helping families. We've been helping them in court. We've been helping them in the legislature. We've been fighting the rise of hate violence in our communities. We've been advocating for uh, immigrants on the shop floor, in tenements, uh, all sorts of places. We've been dealing with affirmative action. We've been dealing with Asian American studies. And that all comes because of the support that you've been giving us. And to recognize these accomplishments and to preview where we're going to be going in the next 50 years, let's take a quick look at this video that commemorates our 50-year history. There was a workshop in New York City in 1974 about legal rights of Asian Americans. The people who attended were interested and concerned about how Asian Americans were not being represented in the legal system. It was really out of that workshop that ALDEF grew. We set up legal clinics, distributed legal rights materials in multiple languages. We set out to demystify the law. We had our small little office down in Chinatown. The current office is at 99 Hudson Street where we moved in the early 80s to be part of the Public Interest Law Center. We joined together with the NECP Legal Defense Fund, Latina Justice and Council of New York Law Associates. We would have brown bag lunches, we exchange ideas. It was the cultivation of these 
national civil rights organizations representing communities that were growing in power and growing in number. The Asian American community is diverse and growing. The nation's fastest growing minority. And they flex that power at the polls, having an increasing influence on America's political leadership. We want to be part of democracy, and we want people to take the Asian American vote seriously. We are there talking to people in their native language, asking them questions that were important to them. The Asian American exit poll allows us to see what our communities across the country and within jurisdictions care about and get that information to stakeholders who can reflect that in policy. There were many people who had registered and were eligible to vote, but they did not speak English fluently. And that helped to make the case for a bilingual ballots for the first time in New York City. A lot of the labor standards in the community were transposed from Asia. You know, a dollar an hour and sharing your tips. ALDEF was one of the few, if not the only group, that spoke out in support of the workers. We represented restaurant workers at Silver Palace who formed the first independent union. Their employer was stealing tips and not paying minimum wage. That encouraged a lot of other workers to organize in their workplaces. It sends a clear message that Chinese Americans will stand up for their rights and they won't tolerate labor law violations. The International Ladies Garment Workers Union had had a contract with Chinese garment owners and workers for many years, and the contract was up for renewal. Factories thought it was an opportunity to try to block the union. The union called a rally. They invited Aldeth to speak because we were one of the community organizations that actually came out to support the union very early. Chinese contractors made themselves to be victims of factories. After that, the renewal contract was signed. And it just shows that if you stand up and speak out, um, it's inevitable you can get results. There was a play that was being done with an Asian American role taken by a white person in what they call yellow face. A number of us felt the role should go to an Asian actor. The whole New York theater and cultural establishment said that we were essentially political correctness run amok. All deaf stepped up. I remember opening night because we had arranged to get all of these um, police permits. There was a huge crowd that was protesting. Most of us were artists, so to have people familiar with resistance and social justice, that was kind of a stabilizing force for us. Several decades later, if you're going to have an Asian role, it's pretty much universally accepted. You need to cast an Asian actor. We gather here today to right a grave wrong. There was a bill to set up a commission to commission a wartime relocation and internment of civilians. All that helped with research to support the bill. And so it was a great victory for the Japanese American community. Blame and anti-Asian hate is the kind of thing which has happened throughout our history. And that created fertile ground for anti-Asian violence. And we were involved going to different states where murders were occurring. And then, of course, the dot busters happened. The group involved in the terror campaign to drive all South Asians out of uh, Hudson County and Jersey City. They actually attacked and killed a man. We helped organize a coalition following the trial where members of the Dot Busters were prosecuted and convicted. Go forward to 9-11, it's the same message. We work with South Asian communities and Muslim communities who have been fighting, you know, 
harsh surveillance um, as a result of Islamophobia. And so the work that we're doing is aimed at ensuring that Asian Americans can call the United States home. When we first started ALDEF in 1974, the population of Asian Americans was about one and a half million nationwide. Now it's 24 million Asian Americans. When issues affect one community within the larger Asian American community, it is incumbent on all of us to mobilize. That means that the many other organizations that we each collaborate with will make all the difference. We see ourselves as part of a broader social justice ecosystem. I hope we will continue to be building partnerships with different community groups and expanding on our vision of community lawyering. ALDEV has had an incredible 50 years. In the next 50 years, I want to make sure we really build upon that history. I'm excited to be thinking about the work that we all get to do together. Hi, I'm Margaret Fung. <laughs> I want to welcome you all here tonight. Um, I've been so fortunate to work with many of you and to have a wonderful and dedicated staff of now 24 lawyers, organizers, and administrators who are committed to the fight for social justice. <laughs> it's been a busy and challenging time. To name just a few recent activities, we're representing Filipino nurses in several states to challenge unlawful employment contracts where they feel forced to work long hours for fear of severe financial penalties. We released a new anti-Asian violence toolkit to support individuals who have faced anti-Asian violence and to provide a framework for addressing anti-Asian hate. And we're mobilizing hundreds of volunteers for our multilingual Asian American exit poll and for monitor poll sites across the country to ensure that this year's presidential election, one of the most consequential of our generation, reflects the voices of Asian Americans. There are many people who should be recognized tonight. I'll just mention a few uh, of our friends um, <coughs> uh, from the federal court, Denny Chin, Judge, Denny Chin, Judge Kiyo Matsumoto, <laughs> and Judge Peggy Kuo are here tonight. <coughs> there's many others, but there's one person in particular who deserves special attention, and that's senior staff attorney, Stanley Mark. He's been with the organization for more than four decades. In fact, he was one of the first full-time staff attorneys um, in our early office in 1977 with Susan Chong Wong, who's also here tonight from Honolulu. <laughs> Stan was our lead on the Japanese American Readers campaign in the 1980s. He expanded our community partnerships and legal clinics, and he trained generations of student interns. Please give him a special round of applause. Stan. And so now I'm pleased to introduce tonight Bethany Lee, who will assume the position of executive director in October. Yay. <laughs> Bethany began her career at ALDEF as an Equal Justice Works Fellow. And since rejoining the organization as legal director in 2022, she's demonstrated tenacious leadership on a range of civil rights issues. She's advocated on behalf of those experiencing displacement and housing insecurity. She's passionate about educational equity and language access. And she's fighting for workers' rights, fair immigration practices, and justice for those who've experienced hate violence. <coughs> I've had the pleasure of working with Bethany for many years now, and I know she will lead the organization with creativity, hard work, and good humor. Please welcome Bethany Lee. Hi, everyone.
and good evening. Thank you, Margaret, for the kind introduction, and thank you for all of you for being here tonight. ALDEV has always been more than an organization. ALDEV's growth has reflected the growth of the Asian American community and that of the Asian American movement. All of the stories that you see and hear here tonight that include legends like Yuri Kuchiyama, Gordon Hirabayashi, Corky Lee, and so many others standing with us at our picket in the, on our picket line and challenging unjust laws with us. That is because of Margaret and Stan, who dared to dream big. So thank you for dreaming. Thank you for building all that. As we mark our 50th year, we also look to the future. As Margaret rightfully noted, important work remains ahead. We face significant challenges and threats. Safety and a sense of belonging are fundamental rights, but we are witnessing an escalation of anti-Asian violence in all of its forms. Stereotypes of Asian Americans have led to overt discrimination, such as the Florida alien land law that has barred Chinese nationals from purchasing property. And we're on the precipice of yet another historic election with real consequences for those who are most vulnerable in our community. So what a moment to dream. What a moment to build together. We will challenge racist and discriminatory laws as we are the Florida alien land law in the 11th Circuit at this moment. We will mobilize hundreds across the country to ensure that Asian American voices and votes are protected at the polls this fall. And we will not only defend, but we will expand the rights of immigrants in this country. Because where there are threats, where there are challenges, our movement must hope, we must dream in the same way our immigrant parents and grandparents have. Our movement must draw from community. In this community is why I so very much look forward to working with each of you in the many years ahead. Thank you for being here tonight to celebrate, but more importantly, thank you for the critical work we will be doing together, because this is yet another moment that demands not only that we dream, but that we act. But, wow, um, I've been here for 44 of the 50 years and it is so inspiring, first of all, to have Margaret, who's been <laughs> our champion all these years, and then to hear Bethany, hear somebody who came up through the ranks here, somebody who's worked as an intern, somebody who came as a fellow, somebody who's now our legal director, who has so many skills, so many experiences, this is a mature organization that grew somebody right here, and now they're ready to lead, and we look forward to celebrating uh, Bethany in October. But first, let's give another round of applause to our Margaret for all the wonderful things she did. I'm, I'm very happy to report that she has agreed to be Director Emerita which means that she will still be here for several years, giving us her wisdom, giving us her contacts, giving us her compassion, giving us the things that she has shared with us for 50 years. Mm -hmm. And that is something that Bethany can use, that all of us can use. That's the way that we are in this social justice ecosystem. We nurture ourselves, we bring people together, and we work with our communities. And so it's very heartening to hear the two of you speak here. Um, now, uh, Richard's going to lead us as we talk about our 50 for 50 program. Yeah, so the Division of Labor is still talks about the vision. I talk about the mine in Visual City. <laughs> um, so I in honor of our 50 years, uh, we've embarked on an ambitious campaign. We call it 50 for 50. This year, we've been inviting dedicated supporters to help prepare us for the work that, that we need to continue. Our goal is for 50 of you, be it individuals, corporations, or foundations, to pledge $50,000 to the organization by the end of the year, and, and we're well on our way to achieving that goal. Support of this magnitude will enable ALDEF to continue its vital work 
We'll share more details about this campaign later this evening. And we'll also recognize those of you uh, who've already made a substantial financial commitment. So let's take a look at the screen. Um, we're going to recognize the sponsors of this evening's uh, festivities because without the support of these people and organizations, we would not have been able to have this event. Okay. So our Dress to Circle sponsors are Macy's, Sony, Wachtell Lipton, and Wild Gosherl. Um, we have champion sponsors that include John Chu and Teresa Wallace, Deba Voice Plimpton. Let's have some applause, yes. Uh, Hunton, Andrews, and Kurth, uh, Terry and Richard Kim, uh, Thomas Kim and Erica Kuo. Okay, thank you. Uh, our own Sandri Leung, who's our board member, and Dimbles Pond. Uh, Min Slevin, Oric Harrington, thank you. Patterson Belknap, Pfizer, Okay, thank you. Uh, Quinn Emanuel. Okay. Uh, Williams Connolly. Okay, thank you. Wilmer Hale. Okay. And Zuckerman Spader. Okay, thank you. And finally, thanks to all of you who are patrons, friends, sustainers, defenders, and supporter level sponsors. We're grateful for every single one of you. So, uh, now, Sri and uh, Cindy are coming. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. It sounded like a threat. Sri and Cindy are coming up now. Watch out, everybody. Well, while we're acknowledging all these wonderful donors, and by the way, I don't think we made enough noise for these donors. Let's make some noise. <laughs> you know, when we go to our AJA and Saja journalists meetings when the tables are announced they make a lot more noise than <laughs> these lawyers so we got to get them working on that uh, we want to raise a glass in admiration of the commitment of all those who have sustained all deaf over the years first let's recognize all deaf's current staff please stand everybody and also the current all deaf board of directors thank you for ingenuity and dedication thank you For All Deaf's 50th anniversary tonight, many former staff and board are also here from every decade since the 1970s, so please stand. Thank you so much. We also, we also want to acknowledge the many pro bono lawyers, student interns, and volunteers who have worked with All Deaf all of these years. If you're here tonight, please stand up. Thank you so much, yes. And that's you both here in the audience and online watching. Your financial contributions and advocacy help make All Deaf's mission a reality, benefiting the lives of millions of people in the United States and around the world. So let's pick up our glasses and cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Okay, I just have to ask you guys to do something. First of all, I've been at Channel 2 for 30 years, right? So every few years they switch my schedule around. So I just want you to know, right now I'm at 9 a.m., 9 to 10 in the morning, Monday through Friday. We focus on positive news like community work. So I'm going to put you guys on TV tomorrow morning. We're going to talk about this. So what I need you to do, because i got to be the camera person, what I need you to do is like wave, like you're really happy, okay? Yes, I'm, I'm serious, you guys. I know it's lawyers, but come on, <laughs> wave. Yes, and I'm going to show you guys. Here we go. Cheers, guys. Yes, yes. Oh, awesome. I am so proud of you. 
You're going to break any union laws <laughs> when you did that? <laughs> no. no, that's the thing. I have to shoot it or a camera person. Like you right. couldn't shoot it. That's ah, the rules now. Okay, anyway. Good. <laughs> All right, now we want to turn our focus to the remarkable individuals we are honoring tonight. And to d introduce our first award recipient, I am delighted to invite Elizabeth Ferguson to the stage. <laughs> Betsy Ferguson is the Deputy General Counsel for CVS Health. She also served as Senior Vice President at Medco Health Solutions and spent nine years as the Assistant U.S. Attorney for the District of New Jersey. Betsy is here tonight to present the Justice in Action Award to her mentor and friend, Sam Kichi. Please join me in welcoming Betsy Ferguson. Thank you. I'm, I'm loud enough, honestly. <laughs> um, last thing we need is me with the microphone. So thank you very much, Cindy, and thank you everybody for having us here. Um, I, I have a very long speech about Sam that I'm going to, was supposed to give, but honestly, most of it is in your, the booklet you received where you talk about his bio. So I'm going to break from my speech, which is going to scare everyone who knows me, and just talk about how wonderful Sam is, right? Like, you can read and you're going to hear about Sam's journey. He came here fi at five. He got dropped off at kindergarten, didn't speak a word of English. And now he's the general counsel at CVS Health. And that's, his journey is an amazing one. But really, what is so remarkable about Sam is he's an incredibly kind man. He's really smart. He's generous. He mentors people. And he cares about that in the people with whom he works. And honestly, I think that's sort of rare. So you're going to, Sam's going to accept via video. He's so sorry he can't be here tonight. But when you hear his journey, just remember, what a wonderful, wonderful person he is. Now, to his chagrin, he lives three doors from me. He started, <laughs> we met for coffee downtown, and then he got pale when he realized how close I lived to him. He won't let me meet his wife. I'm a little sad about that, but I'm going to make that change this summer. But he's just, he's, he's a remarkable person with whom to work, and I'm really lucky to work for him, and I'm honored to, to introduce his video. Um, and I hope what comes through in the video is just how remarkable he is. Thank you very much. Betsy, thank you for that introduction. And my apologies that I can't be there in person. I had a personal commitment that I could not move. I want to thank the Board of Directors of the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. I want to thank all of you in attendance tonight. I want to thank my fellow honoree, and quite frankly, all the honorees that have come before me for this honor. As I was reflecting on receiving this recognition, I thought about the importance of storytelling. You know, we all have uh, experiences and people that have impacted us, and I've been blessed where I've had multiple uh, mentors and people that have taken an interest in me. And the two people that are probably most formidable in that experience have been my parents. When my parents arrived in this country over 50 years ago and brought my sister and my brother and me over, it was very simply in search of a better life, better economic opportunities, the freedom to worship how they chose, to live where they wanted, and to pursue the dream for the next generation. When I arrived in this country, I was five years old. My second day in the United States was my first day in kindergarten, and I spoke two words of English, yes and no. And uh, it's quite humorous because I have two grown-up boys who are 19 and 21, and their vocabulary is also yes and no. I've had the privilege to arrive in this country, be supported by organizations such as the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, have the honor to serve in the United States military, the privilege to go to law school, and to attend institutions like Georgetown, Fordham, and Northwestern. Those are opportunities that I could not even imagine been possible for me. They were made possible because of the hard work of my parents, because of the support of many mentors, and because of the institutions such as the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund who supports those American ideals that opens the access of opportunities to many. It's about how we can fulfill the hopes and dreams of others. How we can help our community and our society live up to those American ideals so those opportunities are open to a broader, more diverse, more inclusive population. So all of you assembled in this room are doing your part, whether it's through funding the mission 
of the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, whether it's through pro bono advocacy or just supporting the numerous causes that continue to open the aperture of advancement for a broader group of people. While it's an honor and I humbly accept this recognition, the credit really does not belong to me. It belongs to all of you that are in the audience tonight that provide major funding and support for programs in the Asian American community. So I'm proud to be listed with my fellow Justice Award winners and the previous winners that have come before us. And I want to thank all of you for attending and supporting the programs tonight. And I want to thank the Board of Directors of the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund for this recognition and for all the work that you do for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy, for that introduction. And Sam's story really is inspiring. Coming to this country, as we all heard at the age of five, knowing only two words in English. As you heard, his 17-year-olds also say, only no and yes, so you know that. But all kidding aside, it's now time to welcome our next presenter on stage. Alice Sue is a partner at the Oric Law Firm and a member of the All Deaf Board of Directors. Please put your hands together for Alice Sue. Thank you, Shri. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to all the and this evening's organizers for giving me the opportunity to, pre to present this year's Justice in Action Award to legal legend and trailblazer, Don Tamaki. <laughs> Don has made major contributions to civil rights and building coalitions and alliances from the start of his legal career. As an early advisor to Alda 50 years ago, a co-founder of the Asian Law Alliance in San Jose, an executive director of the Asian Law Caucus in San Francisco, as well as in private practice at Minami Tamaki, Don's collective efforts have not gone unnoticed and his recognitions are too numerous to name. But after serving as managing partner of Minami Tamaki and most recently, he attained senior counsel status, which he told me means, in other words, I get to do what I want to do, <laughs> which includes continuing the good fight for equal access to justice in the community and serving, appointed by the governor, on the California Task Force to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans. Of special significance to highlight for many of us here tonight, over 30 years ago, Don was on the Quorum Nobis team that reopened the landmark Supreme Court case, Korematsu versus United States, and overturned Fred Korematsu's <laughs> conviction for refusing, as an American citizen, to be incarcerated on account of his racial ancestry. In 2017, I and others here tonight worked with Don when we served as pro bono co-counsel representing the adult children of Fred Korematsu, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Min Yasui, along with ALDEF in amicus briefs, other civil rights organization and minority bar associations joined uh, to challenge the Muslim ban in Trump versus Hawaii. <laughs> Don also co-founding Hashtag Stop Repeating History, an educational platform to inform the public of the danger of unchecked presidential power, whether during World War II or today. <laughs> Although the Supreme Court ultimately upheld the Muslim ban, Chief Justice Roberts finally declared Korematsu was gravely wrong the day it was decided, has been overruled in the court of history, and to be clear, has no place in law under the Constitution. <laughs> Tonight, I am honored to present Don Tamaki with the 2024 Justice in Action Award.
Good evening. I should quit while I'm ahead. It's not going to get any better than this, folks. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, it is very special to be introduced by Alice Sue. In our opposition to Trump's Muslim ban, Alice was masterful in orchestrating her then Aiken Gump partners with the, uh, and these are Supreme Court appellate partners, with the Quorum Nobis legal teams of Korematsu Hirabayashi and Yusui to enable us to file an amicus brief reminding the court that the last time it banished a racial uh, group, it was a civil liberties disaster. Justice Sotomayor, as, just, uh, as Alice has mentioned, cited our brief in her dissent in the court's 5-4 ruling upholding the ban, but at least the court excoriated the 1944 Korematsu decision as being wrong the day it was decided. So Alice, we are forever grateful to you. Thank you. I'd like to shout out to my partners at Minami Tamaki LLP and especially Dale Minami, who many of you know, founder of the Asian Law Caucus, lead counsel in reopening the Korematsu case, recognized by ALDAF in 2009 with the Justice in Action Award, a recipient of the ABA medal, joining luminaries like Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Thurgood Marshall, and for whom I am sometimes mistaken for, since we all look alike. <laughs> and I'm, when I'm congratulated for Dale's achievements by folks thinking I am him, I don't get mad, I don't get up upset, I simply say thank you, but I owe it all to Don Tamaki. <laughs> there you go. I'd like to thank uh, my lovely wife, Suzanne Atai, who deserves credit for listening to my angry Asian man rants for the millionth time. Now, as one of the old timers in this room, I am honored to lift up all that. While his 50 years of advocacy stands out for protecting low wage workers and tenants, voting rights, fighting anti Asian hate and Islamophobia, and reborn Jim Crow era alien land laws in Florida and in Texas. What is underappreciated is how incredibly difficult it is to turn nothing but a visionary idea into a change-making institution that will last for 50 years. <laughs> 50 years ago, Asian Americans were invisible and powerless. The community that I grew up in had only a few years earlier been incarcerated in concentration camps. And folks were so traumatized that they rarely talked about their bitter experience. In contrast, most of us here in this room are lawyers, Asian American lawyers. But 50 years ago, the number of Asian American attorneys would probably fill one or two tables at the most. So 50 years ago, 1974, Margaret Fung and Stan Mark, issuing conventional jobs, money, and security, dreamed of an Asian American civil rights organization. Margaret and Stan traveled to Oakland to meet with Dale Manami and the rest of us rabble at the Asian Law Caucus which had formed just two years earlier. Our tiny storefront office had been a sewing machine repair shop, and we met over a conference table made out of a door that you would buy at Home Depot. <laughs> Never mind that the Asian Law Caucus had no money or that we were doing this for the first time. And Dale would be the first to admit, we were flying by the seat of our pants. But for Margaret and Stan, the fact that the caucus was bringing civil rights cases in behalf of Asian Americans was sufficient proof of concept that all deaf could be possible. And when I have to admit, when they first raised this issue of a national civil rights organization, I thought, hmm, that sounds preposterous. <laughs> and then I realized, shit, they're serious. <laughs> yeah. 
So shortly thereafter, on March 14, 1974, we incorporated ALDAF. Who knew that ALDAF was really a California corporation and remains incorporated in California? Factoid. Big dreams aside, though, it was a single-minded determination of Margaret Fung, Stan Mark, Susan Chong Wong, their passion for justice, their willingness to work for next to nothing, and their understanding that lawyering combined with organizing could be potent tools to empower our community, all of which made the founding of ALDEF a reality. So big congratulations to Margaret Fung in her retirement. A deep, a deep bow to you, Margaret, for a job well done. And thank you, Susan Chong Wong, for steadfast commitment as among all devs first attorneys and for decades as a board member. And may I also say thanks and condolences to Stan Mark, who is still serving out his sentence at all Def. But doing a fine job. Way to go, Stan. All kidding aside, I don't have to remind you of the challenges today facing our community, other people of color, let alone the most serious threat in modern times to American democracy itself. As we remember, the jarring image of Confederate flag-toting insurrectionists smashing their way into the Capitol, longing for a racial social order that should have ended with the Civil War, we realize that much is at stake. So where do we go from here? We can start by channeling the resolve of folks like Margaret, Stan, and Susan, and others, who for the past 50 years have demonstrated the courage of their convictions. And by bringing justice to many, empowering our community, and holding the nation to its professed ideals, the staff, the board, the volunteers of ALDEF over the decades have shined a light on the path ahead, combining legal work with organizing and effectuating and educating our community and the public at large to change hearts and minds. Yes, litigation is an important tool in effectuating social change, but litigation has its greatest impact when it also becomes a tipping point for changing the values and beliefs which undergird the policies that dictate whether our society will operate equitably or inequitably. For that piece, we all need to play a role by giving generously to all deaf. And for example, by insisting that diversity, equity, and inclusion programs at our workplaces continue. We honor all deaf's legacy by rejecting policies that pit Asian Americans against other people of color, as has occurred as has occurred in the Harvard Affirmative Action case. We do our part by demanding truth-telling at a time when our nation is so truth-challenged. And we carry out all deaf's vision by supporting causes that dismantle the systems that have turned out huge and growing racial disparities. So thank you, all deaf, for 50 years of lighting the way forward. Thank you. And finally, our last Justice in Action Award recipient tonight is actor Simu Liu. Presenting the award tonight is Cindy Uh. She is a literary agent at Creative Artists Agency. 
She's graduated from UCLA Law School and is a former All Deaf intern. Do we love that, right? <laughs> Please welcome Cindy A. Uh. Um, it's amazing to be back at this gala with all of you to celebrate 50 years of this amazing organization. As a summer legal intern in the summer of 2005, this is really a full circle moment for me. And I couldn't be more thrilled to introduce our final honoree, actor, writer, and activist, Simu Liu. Simu made history as the first Asian Marvel superhero in Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. You saw his unforgettable moves in another iconic role in Greta Gerwig's Barbie, which was last year's highest grossing film. Among his many accolades, though, Simu's advocacy off screen has been just as impressive. In 2021, Simu penned a guest column in Variety, using his platform to denounce racist rhetoric like China virus and call for greater public awareness of anti-Asian hate. Simu is also a best-selling author. His memoir, We Were Dreamers, takes readers on his unlikely journey from Harbin, China to Hollywood. It is a testament to his family's story as much as his own, bridging generational and cultural divides to show that common ground is shared in the courage to dream big. A shameless plug, but he did provide a signed copy of his book, which is available at the auction. Um, Simu has de demonstrated what's possible when we make our voices heard and the incredible power inherent in shaping our own stories. It's an honor to present this award to Simu. Um, and while he is so sad he could not be here tonight, he has provided his acceptance by video. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I want to start off first by saying how absolutely gutted I am that I could not be there in person to accept the Justice in Action Award. It means an immeasurable amount for me to receive recognition from a community that I am so, so proud to be a part of, a community of activists, change makers, and storytellers who all share a common experience and a common fight. Now, growing up, I imagine a lot of us came from families that wanted nothing more than for us to keep our heads down, to not cause a ruckus, not make noise, just to work hard and survive. Quiet endurance and resilience became the quintessential identity of Asian America, and we were so good at playing that part that America listened. Asian Americans don't count as visible minorities. Asian Americans don't need government assistance and support. Asian Americans don't need representation in media. Asian Americans don't experience racism and discrimination. This is what many Americans still think of us, if at all. Now, it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized just how damaging this all was. And by adult, I do mean almost 30 years of age. I watched a little play in Canada called Kim Convenience and found myself bawling my eyes out. And I didn't initially know why. And I realized later that it was the first time that I had seen my own experiences and struggles on stage. I'd literally never felt seen before then. And art, whether it was television, films, or theater, had a funny habit of pretending that people like me didn't exist. But feeling seen in that moment unlocked something and changed my perception of what was possible for myself and for my future children. That is the power of making yourself heard. That is the power of rocking the boat and causing a ruckus. And as my career progressed, I've tried to remain true to this idea of possibility and power. As an actor and a public figure, I wanted to show that it was possible to be a superhero. It was possible to be an iconic American doll going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ryan Gosling. Uh, it was possible for an Asian person to tell a joke, host SNL, host Kimmel, be on the cover of Time, Vanity Fair, Men's Health, whatever have you. But most importantly, I wanted to show that it was possible that Asian Americans could be loud, unapologetic, and unwaveringly proud of who they were and where they came from. I know that I'm in great company among people who think and feel the same way tonight. And I'm once again honored and humbled to be recognized among you. And I am so excited to continue to cause a ruckus and cause a scene with all of you. Thanks again. Who's ready to be loud and make some noise and make some ruckus, as he said? Let's have another round of applause for our presenters and honorees, especially Sam, Don, and Simu. Now, how are you all doing? Are you still posting on Instagram and X and threads and LinkedIn? My goodness. Are you using the hashtag AllDeaf50? 
Before we conclude our award ceremony tonight, we're joined uh, now by ALDEF co-president Phil Tajitsu Nash and ALDEF's supporter John Chu, a 2014 Justice in Action Award recipient. Please come on up. Wow, it's, it's so heartening to hear these talks, um, to hear these three Justice in Action uh, recipients. You know, um, this organization could not exist without the inspiration that comes from people like Don, from Simu, from uh, Sam, and all the other honorees. If you look to our website, you'll see the names of all the other people that we've honored. It, it's really inspirational. And for me, there's also inspiration from just looking at Margaret, looking at Bethany, looking at our staff, looking at all the volunteers. You know, all these people have put their heart and soul into getting through 50 years. Now, you've all gone to a 50th wedding anniversary. You know how hard it is for couples to persevere, to raise their children, to do other things. Well, ALDEF has gone through a number of stages also. ALDEF was very difficult. We are at our first place down, uh, right by uh, Chinatown, right off of Canal Street, 43 Canal. We moved over to 350 Broadway. Then we moved over to 99 Hudson. And we were just at 1.4 staff members. Then we grew a little bit. Then we grew a little bit more. You know, ALDEF really has grown through so many stages. And when you think about 50 years, 50 years is very difficult. And to get to the next 50 years is going to be difficult as well. It's like a rocket. We've gone through the first stage. We have to drop something and move to the next level. We're getting ready to propel ourselves into the next level. And so when you think about that, I hope that you will think about ways that you can help ALDEF get to that next stage. Because our staff and volunteers have worked on things that are practical, essential, and fundamental. We've helped poor Asian Americans, people working in garment factories, people working in restaurants. We've helped them to get millions of dollars in back pay, uh, overtime pay. We've been a leader in helping protect voting rights. Again, voting rights are being challenged. As Don was saying, this is a time we need to come together and protect our voting rights, protect our voting system. And in terms of the fundamentals, we help to protect the Asian Americans who are trying to assert themselves. People like Simu is, can be as bodacious as he wants. And it's partly because we work with people like David Henry Huang and BD uh, Wong and others to challenge the Miss Saigon show, to do other things to make sure that people who are trying to caricature us and portray us as less than human, that that has got to stop. And so we combine our legal skills, our community organizing skills, our sense of history, our sense of working with a broad coalition in the social justice ecosystem. And if you agree with that model, I hope that you will dig deep, either tonight or later, hopefully tonight, and support ALDEF's important work. Now, for those of you who are tech savvy, uh, right here on our program, you can see right there, it's something called a QR code. If you're into Greek history, it looks like uh, where the Minotaur was walking around in a labyrinth. Uh, and, if you're, and if you're an internet amphibian and you really have just crawled out of the analog world into the digital space, you don't know what I'm talking about. But basically speaking, we need to have people fill in that code. Just go there with your phone and you can make a donation right away. For those of you who still have a checkbook, anybody have a checkbook? <laughs> no, sorry. Um, I also want to sell you my CD player. Um, now, the best way that you can help right now is the wonderful silent auction we've got out there. How many of you have made a bid? Okay, well, I don't see enough hands. We've got wonderful stuff out there. And you know that we've got David Henry Huang's uh, play, Yellow Face. We've got tickets, and you can go out for drinks with a playwright. We have uh, Perry Young right here with his war. How many of you have seen Warrior? We've got a poster plus coffee with Perry. <laughs> Comedian Ronnie Chang, who is one of our JIA uh, recipients, he's donated an autographed uh, Shoyeral martial arts jacket. 
We've got Taylor Swift uh, things for the Swifties here. Um, and the auction is open until 9 o'clock, so you still have time. Um, there are also people who are participating in our 50 for 50 campaign. And again, as we said, this is very, very important. We want 50 people or organizations by the end of the year who can give or pledge $50,000. Those of you who are mathematical, I know some Asian Americans may be good in math. That's, uh, that's quite a lot of money. And so we have 20 individuals so far. We hope to get some more. And I'd like to right now acknowledge one who's been very, very influential, John Chu, who is a himself a 2014 recipient of the uh, Justice in Action Award. And he offered to match the pledges from other former honorees. He said, up to $250,000 I will pledge if you will give. And he brought in 10 new people. So thank you, John. So I'd like, uh, if you can listen to John for a few minutes, he's got some words. Thank you, John. Th thanks, Phil. As I look out, I see a lot of good-looking people. People are very, very successful. People, I think, of means. And so I want to make a special pitch today for the 50 for 50 campaign. All deaf as you all know, is an incredibly important organization for our times with 50 years of groundbreaking, gr groundbreaking advocacy. All Deaf remains at the front line of defending Asian American rights, and there's still so much work for All Deaf to do. Your support of the 50 for 50 campaign will help All Deaf immeasurably to do more for our Asian American community. I'd like to just give a huge shout out to all the public company general counsel, all former JIA awardees who really jump-started the 50 for 50 uh, campaign and responded to my challenge. As I look out here, um, for all of you, especially law firm partners, general counsel out there, I can think of no better way to honor Margaret's legacy to help jump-start the transition to Bethany in October, than for many of you to stand up and make a commitment for the 50 for 50 campaign. $2.5 million we want to put into the bank for all deaf. <laughs> and for every one of you out there, as Phil said, please give as generously as you can a donation of any amount. $50,000, $50, everything will empower the next 50 years for All Deaf, this amazing organization that we all support so much. So thank you for your support. So it's been, it's been a great evening, it's been a great 50 years, and uh, I just want to share one uh, message for uh, Margaret from a very grateful staff and board. Can you come up, please? We're gonna be, we're gonna be having, like I said, a formal transition in October where we're gonna hand the reins over to Bethany and uh, Margaret will go to emeritus status. But right now, we've got these flowers, we've got a card, every one of the board and staff Throw something. And I'd like everyone to raise your glasses and let's have a toast to thank Margaret for 50 great years, to thank her for being a peerless leader, to thank her for being our role model, our friend, and somebody who's helped to get us through the first 50 and who's going to help us transition to the next 50. So again, thank you, Margaret. <laughs> Typical of Margaret, she's going to just do it with her uh, actions. She doesn't want to speak, but thank you very much to Margaret. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Phil. She was trying to escape, so we're not going to let her escape. Uh, Cindy and I have decided we're going to bring Bethany up here, and we're going to grill 
Margaret for about 25 minutes or so. She will love that. But first of all, congratulations. Uh, I want to ask you, Rupa, my wife, who always comes out to support us here at Aldef, she wanted to ask, how did you go on this path that changed your life and changed all our lives and Aldef's lives? How did you know that this is what you wanted to do? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was a music major in college. I wanted to be a musician. I played the piano very well. But I decided also I was working at the New York Civil Liberties Union and I learned about what lawyers do and what impact litigation meant and I really wanted to try to do something in the Asian community because there really weren't many things going on. Fair to say you did something in the Asian community. All right, we know that you can't be like retiring and just laying back on the chair, right? So what, what are you most excited about retiring? Actually, <laughs> a lot, no. <laughs> I'm still thinking about that. I said I, I'm going to wait until after the dinner is over and we can see how successful it's been and then I'll sort of sit and think about what that future is going to be. <laughs> All right, so everybody, you donate so that she can actually retire, so we can do that. Everybody, donate. Before you leave, we know that, first of all, big salute to Bethany for stepping up in these very big shoes. <laughs> Bethany, you only start in October, but we're all with you, and we all support you, and we're going to be there for you every step of the way as you embark on 50 years of doing this. We know, we know that you're going to plan for your retirement 50 years from now. So I'm going to ask Margaret, what advice do you have for young Bethany here that you wish someone had told you 50 years ago? Uh, I just would say to Bethany, I'm not sure whether what it would be, but I just think be yourself and do all of the great work that you've done already. Just keep doing that good work. And I know you have many chances to say thank you and, and show your love for Margaret, but here's one early chance. So when I, I was a baby attorney at Aldef when I started as an Equal Justice Works Fellow, and Margaret scared me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I decided that I was just going to walk into her office and talk to her like I would talk to anyone else. And she was incredible. She was gracious her wisdom, her snarkiness. <laughs> it was my, it was, it's been one of my favorite memories at Aldef, so thank you. All right, I think we put Margaret out of her misery. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you, Bethany, best wishes, good luck. <laughs> Sorry, Margaret, but you can't fire me now. Before we wrap up, I just have one more quick surprise. You heard his name already once. Last year, he was on stage with us. I want to ask Perry Young to come up here. Perry, come on up. We want to remind everyone of the amazing auction items out there, including, all, of all things, a Mike Tyson signed boxing glove and all <laughs> kinds of Yankee memorabilia, Rangers, etc. But Perry is one of the many people whose awards you can, uh, memorabilia you can get. So uh, Perry Young, you all know, is the very nasty, evil Father June <laughs> on Warrior based on the writings of the great Bruce Lee. And uh, you may have seen the show, which is first on Cinemax and then on HBO Plus. Now it is on Netflix. So everyone, please find it. Last year when Cindy and I talked to Perry, we discovered he wasn't such a nasty man. In fact, he's a very nice guy. And I thought it would be interesting. We had interviewed him earlier. Out, 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 out. Just before we wrap up, just <laughs> have you tell us a little bit about that journey that you thought of, that you've been through to be able to have a starring role on one of the biggest shows in the world. More than 1.3 billion people around the world have seen this show. And so that's a chance for us to celebrate this. So Perry. Oh my God, thank you, Sri. I mean, y y I, I didn't expect to come up here, so I had two glasses of champagne. <laughs> so uh, those of you who are Asian in this audience know that my face is probably as red as this. Uh, <laughs> but, um, oh my God, so. This, I mean, there's so much um, views I have for Margaret and Bethany. I mean, 
wow, you know, like I, I think that I do something, a representation in Hollywood, but you guys do something in law, right? Cause yes, yes, absolutely, because that's the size that our, 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 our narrative and, and, and our trajectory in, in America. And I think about what, what you're talking about here is like, I never met my grandmothers because of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. A friend that I collaborate with, mother was born in a Japanese American concentration camp in America. And we, w we do what we do because of the death of, of, uh, of, of uh, Vincent Chin. But man, you know, and then Bruce Lee comes around, right? I'm this little kid, 1972, watching Fist of Fury in Chinatown. And I go, I can do that. Yeah, nothing's gonna stop me from doing that. But then as I grew up, I, I, I came across all these barriers that said, yeah, there are some things that can stop me from doing that. You know, but, but, but the fact that Bruce did what he did, yes, in that uh, with all the barriers against him, and you read about stuff like what Quentin Tarantino is saying right now, you know, about like how Bruce had an attitude, you know, he had a big ego. Of course he did. Look what he was up against in Hollywood, right? I see that today. Of course I'm going to have an attitude to get where I need to get to. Of course, Father June is going to have an attitude, right? You know, there's a line in Warrior that Jonathan Tropper wrote that says, I do what I do for the safety of my people, right? So we got to stick up. And you're talking about who was that uh, that said about uh, Don Phil that said about uh, Simu can have, be bodacious for who he is? We all have to be bodacious, yeah. right? We all do. And you all are in this room are being bodacious in the courtroom. I see what's happening daily right now with Trump in in the um it, you know battling his his uh his hush money right, if if we aren't being bodacious he's gonna get away with that stuff and we are all gonna just be second class citizens until we step up and say we deserve to be first class citizens. I don't know if I answered your question, Sri. <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. Folks, you can bid on having lunch with Perry and all kinds of awesome uh, memorabilia and prizes. So go uh, and thank you, Perry. Thank you for your support. So we are wrapping up the award ceremony, but the evening is far from over. Because before we close, let's take a moment to thank the servers here tonight. From <laughs> they really, you know, help keep us comfortable, happy with the food. And, and I, I like this buffet idea. <laughs> you know, I like this go get your food and sit down and don't eat rubber chicken. And <laughs> there's no break in the award ceremony. Anyway, I was just. Throwing yeah. that out there. Tell us how you really feel okay, about okay, that. Okay, okay, go ahead. <laughs> now, while you dig into your cash for cash in your wallet, please write those checks, scan the QR code. We have one final announcement. There's another performance ahead. You won't want to miss the Bangra performance by the Ajna Dance Company. They're performing at 8.30 p.m. tonight in the reception area, so you want to stick around. And this concludes our Justice in Action Awards ceremony. Let's have one more round of applause for our presenters, <laughs> awardees. Staff, volunteers, and all of you here in the audience and online. It's been our pleasure to host this evening's ceremony. And finally, a special thanks to all deaf staff that worked to make tonight's event a huge success. Assistant Direc Director Jennifer Wang. And plus, a belated happy birthday yesterday to all deaf development assistant Lexi Tayabeo. Thank you all for coming here tonight. Wait, 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 one thing. Okay. This is just a last minute announcement. So tonight, we go home, watch Netflix, Warrior, yeah. right? We watch Perry. Tomorrow morning, you turn on channel two yeah. for a 9 a.m. show, and you can see yourself go like that, okay? Yeah. All right, good Very night. Good. good night, everybody. 9 p.m. auction ends, 9 p.m. Thank you.